are you going to see an inflection point when it comes to the story of science and suddenly open up to the possibilities of science fiction i think it's a very real possibility we saw such an inflection point in the begin at the beginning of the 20th century with the quantum revolution when we discovered quantum mechanics and then a whole set of technologies emerged very rapidly without which the world that we live in today would not be possible none of this would be possible without the quantum technologies we may be on the cusp of a new infle- inflection point we could see uh, ai we could see quantum computing we could see nuclear fusion we could see incredible advances in space travel and what not all of this could suddenly be triggered off in, in this decade possibly so the us government recently announced uh, uh, held some kind of uh, a disclosure kind of event in which uh, a number of U- uh, former us government personnel came out in public and testified on record that the us government is in possession of various alien artifacts and also a uh, non human biologics that's the kind of term that they used abhiji chavda explaining quantum computing to us people talk about ai in the modern day what people fail to understand is that this is one of the most key technologies for our next two or three decades this is one of those episodes where we'll talk about the abc's of computing how computers work the engineering behind computers and then we'll build up to explain what quantum computers are what quantum computing is going to become in the long term This episode has definitely been made from a place of ego because on my series with the cabinet ministers I had an episode with Rajiv Chandra Shekhar sir there was a time constraint when we were recording that episode so I rushed through my process of explaining what quantum computing is I believe I have a fair layman's understanding of what this very very complex topic is I definitely messed up a few sentences because I was rushing my explanation I said that Computers are capable of creating atoms and molecules. I'm an engineering grad. Of course, I know that computers don't work that way. What I was trying to say is that computers are going to become so powerful that they'll be able to simulate the creation of atoms and molecules within the computer. Now, what do I mean by this word simulation? To understand this and more, we have the TRS legend Abhijit Chawla. He's back on the show today. I'm not going to expand much more on this intro. Enjoy today's episode. of TRS where we deep dive into one of the most important technologies that mankind is ever going to build it's a science special it's a future special it's an ACXRA special let's go baby AC is back. We're going to be learning about a new concept today. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. I have to grab the bull by its balls, not mm-hmm. the horns. Okay, that's great. <laughs> uh, and uh, the bull is myself. So the way I'm going to grab myself is by addressing the fact that when we spoke to the Minister of State for Technology, Rajiv Chandra Shekhar, so there was a part in that podcast where I spoke about quantum computing. Mm-hmm. and i tried explaining it to the best of my abilities there was a line that i said in that podcast i said something like at some point these computers will be capable of creating atoms and molecules now uh, the criticism i got for that particular piece was that he thinks a computer can create atoms and molecules now obviously the context was missing there it was a grammatical mistake i meant to say it can simulate uh atoms and molecules which for anyone listening to the entire podcast without a bias they would have got the point and in saying that i think the fault still lies with me because i've not understood the depths of the subject i have understood it from a science fiction perspective and this entire show is all about learning i am also learning as we go forward in the show i don't think i would know anything about geopolitics if i hadn't met you in life and you introduced me to the subject of it a few years ago mm mm-hmm. you introduced me to the subject of geopolitics a few years ago um i've learned about technology through you and i would want to learn about what people call the next big technological revolution which is quantum computing from you uh have you seen that podcast by any chance the rajiv chandra shekhar podcast i haven't this far okay so uh he highlighted two or three very key areas for mm. technological advancement the first was gaming mm-hmm. the second was uh, 
semiconductors. Yes. And the third was quantum computing. Mm. We spoke a little bit about AI, but I think AI has been spoken about a lot on the show and generally in the podcasting world. Quantum computing is possibly going to be bigger and more impactful than artificial intelligence. But very few people understand the true meaning of quantum computing other than actual computer engineers and computer scientists. So this is a podcast for the 12 and 13 year olds out there, uh, including myself. So firstly, apologies for the wrong explanations. Secondly, this whole podcast is a learning process. Here we go. Fabrizio Romano reference. Let's go, sir. So uh, quantum computing. So first of all, to understand what is quantum computing, we need some reference points. So let's first understand what is regular computing. What's a computer? What does it do? So a computer is a thinking machine, so to say. And uh, people have always wanted to create a machine that can think for them. So that's something that people have thought about and tried to construct for centuries, maybe millennia. You had the Greek Antikyra mechanism that was, I don't know how many, maybe 2000 years old or roughly something like that. It's a, it's a mechanism that has, uh, you know, gears and wheels and all that stuff, which kind of uh, output certain dates and certain uh, celestial uh, events which will happen in the future, that sort of thing. So it's a pred predictive machine that uh, the ancient Greeks had created. Uh, then in the 18th and 19th century, people started uh, uh, start constructing mechanical calculators that could uh, calculate, do, do massive calculations to a certain extent. But once again, these were mechanical machines and they were not really thinking machines. They were simply uh, machines that would, would output certain things based on what input you gave them. Uh, but there was no thinking ability in there. Then uh, the the scientist, what's his name? Uh, von Neumann. He came up with the with the first model of what an actual thinking machine would would look like and what uh, what its components would be, and that's why most com all computers that we use today are essentially von Neumann machines. So in a compute in an actual thinking machine, you would have different sections. One would be the memory, one would be the uh, arithmetic and logic unit, you would have registers, you would have random access memory, you would have pages and, and a variety of components. And all of that would enable you to give any task to the machine and it would do it for you. So you could not only uh, ask it to do certain pre predefined tasks, but you could create new tasks, imagine new tasks and program those tasks into the computer using computers, the computer's own binary code, essentially, uh, ones and zeros, and the computer would do the uh, pro programming about the processing for you and give you an output. So what is binary code? So it's ones and zeros. So, so that's essentially what computers understand. So let's say you have a voltage of five volts and you have a voltage of zero volts. Let's consider the five volt voltage is one and the zero volt voltage is zero. And then you apply Boolean logic to it, binary logic, which is, you know, the AND operation, the no, no, and not nor XOR, all those operations. <laughs> you must have, you must remember that from yeah. engineering. Yes, right? my God. Okay, let me let me break this down a little bit for the non-engineering students. Uh, what we enter into any computer when we interact with the computer, computer engineers have devised a way to make that process very easy for us. All we have to do is use a mouse, press keys. It gets entered into that machine. But what's happening within the machine is that there is electronics at play. What you are entering within that machine is becoming electrical signals. Talking about a voltage of one is... Let's say five volts. Yeah, That's five one. volts. We call that one. And a voltage of zero would be... It's, it's a zero. Zero volts. Yeah. So that's the binary. This is how a machine interacts with humans. When you want to transfer data, an A key that you press on your keyboard goes inside as a signal that, hey, the human has pressed A. And the machinery of the computer changes it to a combination of ones and zeros. Now, these combinations of ones and zeros make an AND, make a NOR, make a OR. All that is computer programming related. Basically, all you need to understand is anything that you interact with in a computer, the computer reads as a combination of ones and zeros. And there can be a huge number of combinations of these ones and zeros. For example, one zero zero. 101, 110, 001. That's a set of combinations. Now, if you go into four digits, five digits, the combination possibilities become a lot more. Is this a fair explanation? Yeah, it is a very fair explanation. Yes. Okay. Would you like to add anything to my explanation? Uh, so, so what happens is that uh, 
yeah so so we have ones and zeros and uh, you use logic gates and logic operations so like the like the truth tables that we spoke about yeah. you know uh, so that's how they comp- and then, then the, there is the arithmetic and logic unit there are adders in there and all that and then you have register sizes which which uh, de- define how large the oper- each operation can be and then you have something called the ascii code in which every letter of the alphabet and other symbols are represented as strings of ones and zeros so once you let's say like you said when you press a it's going to input it's going to give the computer a whole bunch of uh, a string of ones and zeros which it will understand as representing the letter a uh, by its logic and things like that so you have the very basic level which is the the ones and zeros level of the uh, computer then you go one s- step higher you have uh, i think it's called a machine language which is a slightly w- one level of abstraction higher in which uh, you can actually do some coding in a certain uh, in, a, in a higher kind of language and that is then interpreted as ones and zeros and th- that's what the computer uh, understands so like you said uh, let's say you have a cell phone okay which is a computer it's a, it has a microprocessor inside it's a computer and you want to send a text message or an email so the the interface of the computer makes it very simple to us it's got some icons you press the email icon and it it will open your e- email account you type some stuff inside and you send it but the actual operations are that are happening inside are all you're toggling voltages you you making them one and zero and there's a whole string of logic operations that's happening and that's what uh, ends up sending your email but if you had to do it all those if you had to toggle those voltages by hand you would end, end up never sending the email so what what you see is many levels of abstraction higher and that's that's what makes it easy for you to use a computer but at the at the heart of a computer you have ones and zeros and all these logic gates and uh, you have you, you have tremendous amounts of of uh, circuits that are built on top of chips so initially what you did for logic operations what you had uh, vacuum tubes so a vacuum tube would have a certain would be either on or off or something like that and that would give uh, the computer the idea of a one and zero wow yeah so initially the computers were enormous because each uh, address of the register would be one vacuum tube and things like that Damn. yeah so you had enormous buildings and enormous rooms that would be just one computer and the computing power would be like today's calculators or maybe even l- less than that so those were the, that was the beginning of, of the co- computer age the actual von neumann machines that could be programmed to do anything and how did you enter programs into these computers you used uh uh those cards you know what, what perforated cards or something that's uh, that's no longer used now but you use those cards that you input into that and the computer would have a machine the card reader machine that would read those perfor- perforations as instructions and then it would co- do the computing and throw out another card for you that you would have to reverse interpret as the result that you wanted i believe there was a scientist who predicted that the processing power of computers will keep increasing with time more more's law more's law what is the law it says that every 2 years or something the processing power doubles that that we have in existence i think it was every 2 years or every every certain amount of time the processing power will keep on doubling and the amount of uh, amount of yeah essentially the processing power on a certain amount of uh, chip size would double which means chips will keep getting smaller uh, chips will get keep getting denser and on smaller as well so if you have a 1 cm square chip which has a certain amount of processing power in let's say 2 years it's going to double the same mm. size mm. that sort of thing why why does the processing power increase with time uh because of advances in technology so miniaturization so what you do is you take a piece of silicon wafer and you etch circuits on top of that these are your logic gates and all that your logic operations the arith- arithmetic and logic unit the the memory the the uh, uh, registers the ad- various addresses and things like that you have a grid structure and you can you know have pins on each of these things and the, that that uh, accesses the memory and then you have various uh, so, uh, specialized pa- part of the chip some of which will be gpu some of which will be a cpu and things like that it's a very complicated thing but overall what you do is you etch these enormous circuits on very tiny silicon wafers and that is done by the process of uh, very large scale integration vlsi and uh, it's it's a two dimensional surface on which you etch all this it is done using something called photolithographic machines uh, and uh, over time you are able to improve the technology so you can uh, squeeze more and more circuits into smaller and smaller regions of areas i've you know? not heard the terms vlsi since engineering college and my trauma is coming back to me <laughs> a little bit. but we'll come back to the conversation right. basically how you spoke about the 
older computers using vacuum tubes mm. in a rudimentary way to transfer the ones and zeros to the computer now that same process is being done in a very tiny space yes it's being done in such an advanced way that some of it is not even visible to the human eye that's, that's how right. small things are getting yes microscopic essentially what's going to happen in 10 to 20 years then? so eventually we're going to reach the limit of how much circuitry we can squeeze into a certain square area uh you know a certain unit unit area of a silicon wafer eventually we're going to not be able to because eventually we we can go down to the atomic level right and then what do we do then we we, we reach a fundamental barrier you can't have anything smaller than an atom so then how do we make a, a computer more powerful that is the question that will eventually arise we are still at at a at a stage where we can still squeeze more more circuitry into a smaller area or maybe we can you know stack circuits on top of each other if we can uh, take care of the heating problem and all that uh, that may be resolved but eventually we're going to run into the uh, the question of how much smaller can we make it we can't make anything smaller than an atom and then the question is what do we do next right and that's where the idea of manipulating individual atoms themselves came up and for, to understand that that's that's where quantum computing comes in and to understand that we have to understand a couple of quantum mechanics concepts that are there are very weird uh, one is the uh, the concept of superposition quantum superposition and the other is the concept of quantum entanglement let's understand quantum mechanics a little bit as a subject in yeah. the first place we did an episode on oppenheimer and nuclear physics the quantum world is the atomic world the subatomic world yeah uh, which means that when anyone seen antman how uh, antman's a big human and then you can shrink him to the size of him being the size of atoms okay now if you are actually able to do that to a human when you shrink that human where he can actually see electrons as a globe in front of him and he can see a massive nucleus as a globe in front of him uh the physics of that world is very different from the physics of the world that we are used to where if i pick up this bell and keep it down on the table there's gravity at play there is a vacuum at play there is sound waves at play all these are down to physics but in the quantum world the laws of physics change absolutely totally i think what scientists have not been able to understand is why the laws of physics change that's the big question am i right yes. there's no explanation right now we don't have any we don't understand why it is the way it is but we know how it is that's why you answer with the universe created it that way or the god <laughs> created it that somebody way. programmed it that way yeah that yeah. it just works like that yeah. we know for sure that the physics of that world is different yes okay now there's too many mysteries also attached to the quantum world which is what people hope that maybe quantum computing might help us solve uh before we actually enter this conceptual conversation again maybe to make the listeners understand quantum computing better say tomorrow quantum computing is perfected mm -hmm. we understand the technology fully why don't you run us through some of the applications of quantum computing and how it's going to change human life and this mm -hmm. is in the 2030s or 40s it's predicted to happen by then go on sir so there are certain uh, operations that if you would ask a regular computer to do it would take it uh, maybe thousands of years uh, because see when you in in a regular computer you have uh, cpus you have gpus you have microprocessors you have multiple cores that work at the same time let's say you have a quad core computer i don't i think it's an ancient term but let's say you have 16 cores 32 cores uh, in a sub super computer you may have thousands of cores working at the same time which means that you have lots of co computations happening at the same time and yet it's not going to be enough because there are certain uh, operations that will not work with that so it, if you if you want to optimize a database and if you want to run through the database in a certain optimized manner it will take too long and uh, various uh, mathematical problems like the prime like calculating prime numbers etc can take too long and prime numbers are very important in crypt cryptography cryptography and things like that you know which are which is a very real world thing uh, so there are certain operations certain computations that will just take too long but if you have a quantum computer you can do them those operations in a manner of matter of minutes maybe maybe even in a matter of seconds so that's where quantum computers in certain uh, applications of computing can vastly 
outperform a standard regular computer, even a massive supercomputer, like the top 10 supercomputers, it will still outperform that. So that's why the world is focusing on quantum computing now. And it is possible that quantum computers may crack any kind of cryptographic algorithm, uh, any kind of crypto cryptographic uh, uh, algorithm or, or crypto uh, encryption, you know. Mm. So you may be able to break any encryption, no matter how powerful it is, uh, and things like that. You may be able to hack into any, uh, any, any, any application. And, you know, this are, the possibilities are essentially infinite. Yeah. Uh, to understand the same point about possibilities and applications further, I want to tell people that all of biology is chemistry. All of chemistry is physics. And all of physics is mathematics. And I learned this line from you. You said mathematics is the language of the universe. Yes. Which means that even when you look at colors, when you look at shapes, it's actually mathematics at play. Now, the mathematics of the universe is so complex that it's beyond the human mind to even understand how much mathematics is around you. Which is why mathematicians are a rare breed in the first place, I assume. Now, here you have a machine that's way more powerful than any mathematician that the world has ever seen. It's way more powerful than any computer of the past. Effectively, you might be able to simulate a universe within that computer. One of the applications of supercomputing today is weather modeling, weather modeling, weather prediction. And it's really hard to predict weather beyond a few days. And it, it's even hard to predict the kind of weather you will have tomorrow. But if you have a quantum computer, it could make the job much easier to pre predict the extremely complex weather patterns of, of, of the planet Earth. And uh, the other thing, like you mentioned, is let's say you want to simulate the birth of the universe, or you want to simulate uh, the evolution of a galaxy based on just a collection of dust that you give a certain number, a certain, certain set of properties and you see how it evolves over time. So that takes an enormous amount of computing power that you only can use supercomputers for and that even then it takes a lot of time to compute that but in a quantum computer it may happen it will definitely be able to will be able to do it much faster and like you said we'll be able to simulate universes tiny universes toy universes baby universes but that's the first step so the initial quantum computers will be able to simulate Cert, uh, universe of a certain size but eventually if you have a large enough uh, quantum computer with enough sufficient power you may be able to create entire universes within that and another thing that we cannot simulate on regular computers is is uh, quantum mechanics itself you know uh, chemical reactions uh, the way different molecules interact with each other how will a protein molecule react under certain conditions uh, and things like that so you could actually be able to discover drugs new drugs based uh, using quantum computers and you will be able to even see the kind of reactions these drugs will have on various kinds of people and things like that so lots of applications are there out there which we currently cannot do using regular computers so science will get furthered yes likely engineering will get furthered because science is getting furthered the moment engineering gets furthered a lot of human possibilities open up better yes. artificial intelligence bots better application for space travel there's no limit to what can happen the moment science forwards itself. Yes. But what are some industries that will benefit immensely? One that I understand is pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals. medicines. Yes. We're going to find the cures possibly for a lot of diseases that we don't know how to cure right now. Yes. Cancer, for example. Yes. We might be able to find the ultimate cure for cancer mm -hmm. through quantum computing. Yes. Um, what other industries will heavily benefit from quantum computing? Uh, quantum computing uh, definitely a uh, cryptography could could be you know you may be able to create unbreakable uh, encryption or you may be able to break the most un uh, unbreakable encryption right now the jury is still out there but that's something that could happen uh, medicine healthcare uh, database searches a simulation of various kinds of, of, of phenomena scientific phenomena uh, natural phenomena uh, you know maybe uh, the prime number, maybe various various mathematical problems. Uh, so right now, uh, certain industries, we can definitely clearly see that they're going to benefit like the pharmaceutical industry and so on. But there are certain things that are still out there. We, we're not quite sure of. Uh, definitely scientific research will be will get a huge impetus with that, especially uh, theoretical physics and quantum physics and all that. Maybe string theory, we'll be able to see whether it works or not. We may be able to simulate uh, various uh, 
kinds of gravity models dark matter dark energy that that sort of thing but i'm sure we will have lots of practical applications as well material science we'll be able to discover new materials uh, ceramics that are heat resistant uh, you know for example we, we want to uh, build better jet engines that can withstand higher and higher temperatures in the turbine blades need to be able to withstand that but uh, eventually the best materials that you have beyond a certain uh, temperature they're going to disintegrate so this may be able to help us uh, discover better ceramics and better materials that can withstand incredible temperatures so the so this this has military applications as well this has commercial applications the possibilities are essentially infinite you could come up with all kinds of new applications that maybe you can't even think of today so this the, the kind of computational power it it will give you is going to open up a whole uh, realm of possibilities you yeah. know you know how we take social media for granted social media exists because of the internet which exists because of computers which yeah. exists because those vacuum tubes were turned into circuits at some point uh, semiconductors yes yeah. back when there were only vacuum to tubes back when there were only vacuum tubes which were used in computers who would have thought that social media and these kind of mental health issues would become a thing eventually mm, indeed so you can't actually have hardcore predictions about what quantum computing can lead to all you can do is turn to the scientists and when you turn to the scientists and ask them about quantum computing people even like michio kaku who's one of the world's most renowned scientists is extremely excited about it. he says that this is the thing he's the most excited about for the period after his death i believe he's in his mid 70s or late 70s i see and he talks about quantum computing with so much excitement because it's going to change the course of humanity would you agree i do agree yes it's going to open okay. up a whole uh, realm of possibilities industrially uh, in the in terms of discovering new things discovering new cures all the all the things that we spoke about it's going to open up lots of possibilities that we don't have today and in the future if you are able to fit a quantum computer into a cell phone just imagine what what kind of power it will give you and obviously the governments and the militaries will benefit the most from it they will obviously have their eyes on certain areas and fields in which they would like to utilize this so yeah the quantum computing is the next frontier every government that uh, that matters every nation that is worth its salt is kind of right now focusing on that the americans are doing that the chinese are doing that uh, india i believe is also now taking it very seriously so yeah a, a number of nations are going to take the forefront in this and the nations that achieve leadership in this may actually end up ruling the world in the 21st century okay. you know it's the era of chat gpt one thing i know about technology is that it's always used researched upon and developed by governments possibly at least a decade before it's available for the public now we are so pumped about chat gpt and everything that it brings to the professional world without really talking about the fact that something like chat gpt has existed with the world government since a while i am sure it has but it's never been revealed to us so if we're talking about quantum computing coming up in the next 10 years chances are that a version of it is already being developed or has been developed uh likely by china now i don't know how likely it is uh that it's developed by china or america but we know it's going to be one of these two and there is a race to develop quantum computing because the moment you've developed quantum computing well you become a force in the world of hacking as well as cyber security you're able to build a very strong armor no one can hack your computers and you're able to hack any computer in the world because a simple thing like password hacking say your password is your birth date there's a fixed number of yes. birth dates you can possibly have yeah. that's a very easy password to break by i think it's called brute force brute force hacking yes even if your password is complex a quantum computer can break the most complex password by just doing brute force password very rapidly yeah because of the amount it's able to calculate yes this is a very dangerous possibility that's coming up someone is going to figure quantum computing and whoever figures it is going to become the most powerful government to ever have existed am Definitely. i right yes yes because you'll be able to uh, crack any kind of security uh every nation has extremely secure communications and and things like that and uh, there are various uh, cryptographic alg algorithms that exist that that give you layers of security if you have a quantum computer you can break down the most complex crypt, uh, you know encryption just using brute force attacks because you have the computing power you know parallel uh, processing that any supercomputer doesn't have so yeah it gives you essentially a superpower that nobody else has so whoever uh, 
does this first is going to have a huge amount of uh, head space a huge leap forward that it will be very difficult for us to to catch up with okay uh who do you think is ahead in the race according to you we're entering a world of geopolitics now yeah i mean the two nations i can think of at the forefront of this are the us and china these are the two nations that have the best computers in the world if you look at the if you look at supercomputers the top 100 it's typically the us china and japan so japan also is a big force in this uh, they are an extraordinarily technologically advanced nation they have some of the best technology in the world as a society they are the, maybe the most uh, high tech society in the world so i would say is the us it's china it's japan maybe south korea to a certain extent maybe russia may also be involved in this in this business uh, to in this race uh, to a certain degree but the four front the four runners would be the us china and japan maybe the us and china and if i were to compare the us and china maybe the us may have an advantage may may have a lead over the chinese uh, despite the hype about china taking making so many advancements the us has a very robust defense industry it has an extremely advanced education system research based universities all the universities are are fully fledged uh, research institutes and uh, you have something called darpa over there which essentially is a funding agency which identifies people who are doing interesting work potentially very valuable work it funds them gives them two or three years to try out their concept whether it uh, succeeds or fails doesn't matter but it gives them a limited amount of time and the the amount of money that is actually required for the research so and the chinese have tried to copy the darpa model and they may have succeeded to a certain extent so i think overall if i were to weigh these two nations i would say the us has an ed- has an edge and maybe they may be ahead of china in this matter Does India have a DARPA equivalent? India does not have a DARPA equivalent. We have DRDO, which is nowhere uh, comparable to DARPA. See, DARPA, you know how it is. DARPA has maybe two fifty people on its payroll. They are not employees. They are people who it funds, and the funding is given for maybe two years, maybe for three years. So it's a flat organization, and nobody is actually on its payroll, but it funds various researchers who are doing research. in various universities so the research is done over there it's not at the darpa headquarters in the case of drdo so so we have maybe 250 people on its payroll maybe 500 people on its, pay, on its payroll at a given amount of time and the budget is about 3 to 4 billion dollars per year drdo has a budget of maybe 2 billion dollars per year 2 2 billion billion so it's it's uh, it's kind of comparable to to darpa's budget but drdo has about 30000 employees out of which 5000 are scientists and 25000 are non scientists so much of the money is being used on god knows what it is being used to pay the salaries of non scientists and even those 5000 scientists i'm not sure what they do there is a very hierarchical structure darpa is a completely flat structure and and in the case of drdo they are all working at drdo facilities and they work for drdo and there is management and god knows what so it's a very different kind of setup in drdo and if you see the kind of results that the two uh, organizations give up the throw up a uh, drdo is not doing bad it is also giving us uh, good results good technology but nothing that is earth shattering in the case of darpa everything that it produces is earth shattering everything is like a significant leap forward and much of it is not revealed to the world much of it is classified for 20 30 40 years 40 years oh yeah definitely like what technology that we use today would have been classified for 40 years for example uh, stealth technology it was first revealed uh, around the time of the, of the gulf war the first gulf war 1991 or thereabouts but that technology was around for at least 20 years if not more the flying wing technology has been around the the concept has existed since the 1940s as in quiet air force planes yeah those planes that cannot be detected by radar they look like flying wings like bats you know the b b something bomber that looks like a boomerang yeah, yeah, yeah. that shape the black one yeah. and its various iterations and nowadays we have uh, fighter planes like the f22 and the f35 that also have stealth features which means that if you shine a radar on it it, it won't be detected detected its cross section will be the, will be the same as a tennis ball even though it's that large of an aircraft so it it has certain substances that absorb radar uh, radiation or the 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 photons and also the angles and all that deflect it in various directions and don't let it go back to the radar uh, uh, machine itself so the overall cross section that the radar will see is that of a tennis ball or maybe less than that so it it doesn't really turn up on the radar screen unless it's a massive giant radar in which case it's very hard to pinpoint the, the location 
Hmm. Okay, so that's how, how stealth works. And this technology was developed by DARPA. The US military initially was not interested in it. But these guys persisted and eventually it's it's what it is today. So now India is trying to develop something similar. It may take time. Stealth technology. Stealth technology. Stealth fighter. So the the next iteration, the, the fifth generation fighter plane that we are trying to develop right now, the AMCA, Advanced Medium Combat Aircraft, which may take its first flight by the end of this decade, will be a fifth generation fighter plane with stealth features. Damn. Okay. Um, What do you think DARPA is working on right now? <laughs> Alien technology, maybe. <laughs> yeah. After this announcement and... Um, who knows? Look, uh, you know, there is this place called Area 51. In I think it's in Nevada or Colorado. Maybe Nevada. It's it's a, a fighter plane and a aircraft testing facility. It's in the middle of a dry dried lake and all that. It has hangars that are always like, uh, you know, shrouded and covered. And we don't know what's inside. Uh, so definitely they are using, they are testing futuristic aircraft, maybe aircraft that we can't even imagine. Maybe some people say anti-gravity systems and all that. Uh, I, I don't know of any physics that would support anti-gravity theories, but yeah, that's what people speculate. So I think whatever DARPA is doing right now would be at least a generation or two generations ahead of what we think technology is at today. Hmm. That's what I can say for sure. Hmm. Okay. And quantum computing would be a big part of one of these research adventures? Oh, definitely. See, quantum computing is something that's now out in the public domain. Okay, we have universities that are that are building quantum computers and actually doing quantum, uh, I mean, I mean uh, actual computing. So they have been able to create working quantum computers, you know, uh, build a vacuum inside, isolate actual atoms and manipulate the atoms, place them into superpositions and entangle them and run quantum algorithms on them on them. So all this has already happened and it's known to the public. So this is the amount of public disclosure that we have. Uh, I think uh, there are a couple of US uh, based organizations that have uh, you know, run quantum computations and all on quantum computers. The Chinese are also doing the same thing. So quantum computers are known to the public. They, it is known that they are and, and some, I think it was Microsoft or somebody who announced that they have achieved quantum supremacy which means that their computational algorithm is superior to that of a classical co computer already in certain cases, in certain computations. So it's already gone beyond what a cal classical computer can do for certain types of calculations, not for everything. So we have, the, the Chinese have announced quantum supremacy, the Americans have also announced quantum supremacy public Publicly, which means that whatever DARPA is doing is, I would imagine a generation at least ahead of that, which means that I, 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 don't, I don't know what exactly it could be, but it could be something way more advanced than what we are seeing right now. Everything that ChatGPT is doing has been predicted since 2015, that one day there'll be an AI bot will do this. And then ChatGPT comes out of nowhere, takes over the world, everyone's talking about it, etc. I think we're going to see a moment like that with quantum computing as well. Am I fair in saying something like this? Like a quantum computer will be spoken about, but obviously first will be used geopolitically in some way. See, what you could do is if you have a robust quantum computer that can do calculations, computations uh, with high fidelity, then you could run an AI on top of that. And then, then just imagine what it could do. Right, AI, artificial, like a chat GPT kind of thing with the power that a quantum computer has. Mm. And if you use that to discover new drugs or to discover new materials or to simulate, let's say, simulate uh, new kinds of nuclear weapons or fusion fusion reactions or something, that could give you a, an enormous uh, you know, uh, lead over anybody else. So you take quantum computing and the enormous power it has, the kind of computational power that no other uh, supercomputer has, and you place AI on top of it, AI software on top of it. See, AI is just a bunch of software. That's what it is, right? And, 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 and the entire data model and all that. You place that on top of a quantum computer, the results could be humongous. So it's it's something we can only imagine right now, but it could, it could you know, create a multiplicative effect and give the the owner of the machine essentially godlike power. Who knows? Would something like this even be released for the public? It won't be released for the public. It's hmm? too powerful to put in human beings. Way sense. too powerful. Way too powerful. Okay. And what I understand about technology is that you gradually discover technology. Like how you spoke about how one atom has been simulated inside a, a quantum computer right now. Am I right? I'm not sure up to what extent they've done, they've gone, but yeah, you can now, I believe, simulate quantum systems, which means atoms and their various quantum states and all that within a quantum computer. And this was not possible before because 
modern day average computers are not capable of that level of calculation even a simple atomic system is way too complex for most computers even super computers you know the orbital shapes and all those things of okay. of, of of a regular atom okay uh i think we've almost reached the end of this episode because it's just an explainer episode but is there any other aspect you'd like to talk about when it comes to quantum computing like what do you really kind of ponder upon in this topic yeah i think the the from my perspective i'm a, i'm a, i'm basically a theoretical physicist what i'm interested in is understanding the secrets of the universe what is dark matter what is dark energy what is the nature of gravitation there are so many questions that are unanswered right now we don't understand 95% of the universe the 95% of the universe is dark for us it's uh, so so maybe we if you could use quantum computing for for doing something good and constructive then you can try and unravel the secrets of the universe maybe simulate various kinds of uh, potential universes in a quantum computer and see what kind of results it it gives you uh, that's one possibility that i can think of uh, the other possibilities are what we discussed various kinds of uh, applications drug discovery and uh, uh, simulation of weather and uh, cryptography and what not so i think it's it's go- definitely going to be something that will revolutionize the world it won't be apparent to us immediately it may take 10 20 years for us to understand what's been going on maybe it's already going on maybe there are governments that have already cracked the 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 secrets of quantum computing hopefully india is not far behind one hopes so so i think it's it's uh, we are on the cusp of multiple uh, revolutionary changes we have already we are already seeing the ai revolution uh, these are uh, text generator ai is image generator ai is we are now seeing uh, music generation and and some kind of video generation which is actually kind of creepy right now it, <laughs> it will it will work out eventually in a few years but uh, that's that's what's visible to the public what's behind the scenes is uh, who knows to what level it is already uh, reached so we have the ai revolution we have the quantum computing revolution you put them together it's going to revolutionize the world everything that they've ever shown in black mirror will be possible in the next 20 years within oh, the next 20 years possibly um what about the kind of stuff they've shown in interstellar where they talk about wormholes time travel as well as um long ass space travel uh as of now i think the long ass space travel is the most likely in the last podcast we spoke about nuclear fusion uh-huh. and how uh you know we we almost kind of figuring that that's the other big scientific story at play lots of people are working on understanding how to control nuclear fusion combine that with quantum computing safe quantum computing is figured earlier it will tell you how to control nuclear fusion oh, definitely. because you'll be able to understand how nuclear fusion can be controlled within a computer hmm yes once you figure nuclear fusion you figure long ass space travel i also believe that when it comes to wormholes and time travel it's all theoretically possible in the same way that once upon a time atom bombs were theoretically possible right. and then they worked upon the engineering of it but that working upon the engineering of it phase took a while which may not take too long when an ai is combined with a quantum computer right you'll be able to simulate all of that in the computer which will tell you how to do it are you going to see an inflection point when it comes to the story of science and suddenly open up to the possibilities of science fiction I think it's a very real possibility. We saw such an inflection point in the begin at the beginning of the 20th century with the quantum revolution when we discovered quantum mechanics and then a whole set of technologies emerged very rapidly without which the world that we live in today would not be possible. None of this would be possible without the quantum technologies. We may be on the cusp of a new infl- inflection point. We could see uh, AI, we could see quantum computing, we could see nuclear fusion, we could see incredible advances in space travel and what not. All of this could suddenly be triggered off in, in this decade possibly. It could happen. Okay. One last kind of phase of this episode is speaking about alien life okay. because the American government announced all that stuff recently about like aliens and UFOs which we spoke about in the Oppenheimer episode. Uh you want to give a tiny recap in a few sentences about what this alien announcement was and this is being recorded I think on 1st August it's 1st August. 1st right? August today. So uh one tiny recap. So the US government recently announced uh, uh, held some kind of uh, a disclosure kind of event in which uh, a number of US, uh, former US government personnel came out in public and testified on record uh, um sworn testimony that the US government is in possession of various alien artifacts and also 
uh, non-human biologics. That's the kind of term that they used. So when they talk about alien artifacts, one could only imagine either entirely intact spacecraft or crashed spacecraft and bits and pieces of that. And when it comes to non-human biologics, it's a very vague term. It could also mean grass or mushrooms or fruits or alien uh, individuals either alive or no longer alive. So that's the kind of statement, that's the kind of disclosure they have made, but they have provided no evidence to back up the words that they have offered to the world. So right now we are at the stage where the US government has released certain certain pieces of video footage over the past two, three years in which they are saying that their fighter planes were, were pursued by, alien, by UFOs, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. They were either chased by that or they themselves chased those phenomena and they were not able to figure out what that was. And now they are making the disclosure that the US government is aware of these alien visitations and they are in possession of various uh, alien spacecraft artifacts. But thus far, no evidence, hard evidence has been forthcoming. So thus far, I am skeptical. When I see hard evidence, I'll believe it. But I would really, I would be very happy if it, if, if, if it were true. Okay, let's kind of put backward logic on this. So say they've found a UFO. That means that some beings from at least, at least another planet in our solar system have figured out how to do interplanetary travel and then come to Earth. And if they're not from our solar system, they're from another solar system, which means they've done inter-solar system travel. So they've figured some heavy level of technology, which very likely means that they've figured quantum computing already. Um, most likely, yes. Why most likely? Because the kind of advances in technology would need would need very powerful simulations in computer in computers to develop the kind of uh, you know the craft that you need the propulsion technology that you that you need maybe it's I maybe it's uh, iron propulsion or maybe nuclear propulsion or something in between maybe antimatter propulsion whatever it is it's a very futuristic te technology the kind of technology we don't have today the only technology we have today is chemical rockets which is a very rudimentary technology so they would need something which is orders of magnitude more powerful and and more effective efficient than chemical rockets because your chemical fuel will you'll run out of it eventually uh, another thing we, we could use is light sail technology which is kind of Going back to the age of sailing on, on, on having sh ships with sails. But to have interstellar travel, you need a better technology. And to be able to devise and, and construct that, you probably would need a very powerful computer to be able to simulate those uh, those uh, things, you know. So most likely, if they have such technology, they may have extremely powerful quantum computers. We are talking about quantum technology being developed in the next 10 to 20 years. Even if this alien race is... 500 years older than us, which is not too long in the macro scale of things when you compare to the universe. Uh, that means possibly in another 500 years, if we survive as a race, we'll be the aliens for some other rudimentary civilization. Definitely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you think that while this announcement has been done by the American government or former government officials, um, if truly we have found alien artifacts or if there's been human alien interaction, maybe the aliens are benevolent, like good. Maybe they're bad. So either they're like Jadu, like uh, who's that silver surfer villain? Uh, Galac Galactos? Whatever, one of these Marvel villains. Uh, Thanos. Thanos. So either they're like Jadu, they're like Thanos or they're somewhere in the middle. They're grey. I would probably think they're somewhere in the middle. See, if if aliens have actually come here, they have visited us, maybe they're among us, and we are still here, it means that they're not going to kill us. Otherwise, they would have done it by now. Mm. So maybe they have good intentions for us. If they actually right. have indeed visited planet Earth and they have not destroyed it thus far, then it means that we should not fear them. It's our version of going to safaris and saying, hey, look at those lions, they're so cute. <laughs> They're probably doing that to us right now. Uh, yeah. Like scanning everything and we are like a global safari for them. Right, yes. But they've figured out uh, don't mess with these people too much. You can interfere in a lion's life if a lion is super unwell. You sedate it and give it medicine and make it better. Yeah. Maybe some version of that is happening to us as we speak. Maybe Such some version of that. Okay. Maybe they will hand over the technology to the US government officials at some point saying that uh, you want to figure quantum computing? Take. Maybe. I mean, do we hand over technology to lions? I'm not sure that lions are <laughs> capable of handling our technology. Right. We don't even know how to talk to lions. 
see, let's say you're a dog or a cat. How do you communicate? You communicate in your own language and the dog understands what you say. Mm. Dogs typically understand our speech. And cats pretend not to, but they also understand our speech. But we never try to understand the dog's language. We never try barking and seeing what it means. So, if aliens come to us, I suppose they would not take the trouble to try and figure out how we talk. They'll talk to us and hope that we will pick up some of it. That's what I would imagine it would be like. Are we becoming smarter as a race? We probably are. Over time, we I hope one evolves in a, in a positive direction and becomes overall smarter. Well, I hope so. Okay, because technology is definitely evolving. Technology is, evol- is evolving very fast. But if you look at the progression of the human species over the past 300,000 years, I think we have developed better and better technology over time. And in the past 100 or so years, it's been like an inflection point And maybe we are at the cusp of another one as well. So maybe it, it's possible that our technology may kind of outpace us and grow so fast that we may be left behind. And uh, like, you know, the, the nightmare scenario of, of Terminator, like you end up uh, creating a super intelligence, which actually becomes self-aware and then gets a mind of its own and then makes its own choices. And then maybe it decides we are no longer needed. So yeah, who knows? That may also happen if we are not careful. Okay. Uh, one last thing I want to highlight actually in this podcast is again, Michio Kaku. And I highly recommend everyone go check out his episodes with Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss. Incredible podcast. Uh, both Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss asked him, other than quantum computing, what is the other technology that you're extremely excited about? He said that maybe it's not a technology as much as it's an area of research, uh, which is this whole genome project where they're trying to map out the DNA sequence of human beings. But he said that once we finish the genome project completely, uh, the next project will be trying to map out a human brain completely. All the neural connections. Now, I'm assuming that within a quantum computer, if you're able to actually simulate a universe, it's very easy to kind of create just a false human brain. Interesting. I I suppose it should be possible to do that. Uh, See, as far as we know, as far as we know, in the entire known universe, the human brain is the most complex machine that exists anywhere. Right, And it's still a part of our universe itself. Yes. Yeah, so I think it could be kind of a challenge even for a quantum computer to kind of replicate the kind of brain that we have. We may be able to make it uh, trace out the path of the evolution of a brain from a very primitive tadpole-like brain into something of a higher animal kind of thing. And it, it may give us very interesting and surprising results. But to exactly replicate what a human brain is like may kind of be a challenge even for a quantum computer. That's what I think. I think it will be able to kind of draw out a path of how the human brain evolution would happen or a a typical brain evolution would would happen. So let's say you have a bunch of neurons, you put them together and that's a very primitive rudimentary brain, the kind of brain brain that you have in a tardigrade or a very primitive animal. And then you ask the quantum computer to try out all the iterations and see how this brain would evolve over, let's say, 10 10 million generations. Let's see how it evolves, what, uh, what things are added to it let's say you have sense organs that you attach to the brain, then how will the brain brain evolve? So maybe it may be able to throw out different versions of how brains would evolve. But would it be able to replicate exactly what a human brain is like? I am not sure. Possibly it may happen. But what I would be interested interested in really would be understanding what consciousness is. Does consciousness actually emerge out of the human brain, out of the complexity of the brain? Or is it something else entirely? That's a hugely... Uh, nebulous and vague subject we don't even have a definition of what con- consciousness actually is so if if we can harness the power of quantum computing will it throw some light on what consciousness is that's something that i would be very interested to know that's the one thing that no scientist has been able to explain oh, absolutely. what is consciousness yes uh, and everyone has their own definition of it yeah. um one way of looking at it is effectively your brain is in charge of anything that's happening in your body Anything that you're thinking, anything that you're feeling, it's definitely in charge of the emotions that you are feeling, right? So if you're feeling sad on a certain day, it's because your brain is probably doing something to make you feel that. It's telling you, it's telling your body, oh, release this song, I'm not feeling so good. Or if there's a death of a loved one, that input goes into your brain, it becomes a memory, that memory releases cortisol, releases, reduces the reduction of dopamine, etc. So it's a combination of electrical signals that massive circuit that's your brain 
as well as some triggers to release hormones which further then play on the brain etc yes, right? again yes. it's a complex machine which i am also struggling to explain yeah uh i personally feel what's dangerous is that if you're able to create a brain inside a computer and you're able to put electricity into it and you're able to put the data of the entire internet into it which is where it gets dangerous and then that brain develops emotions emotions possibly could create wishes and wishes could be hey i feel like destroying my master and taking over the earth not running it my way so as long as the uh, brain that we are talking about is merely a simulation inside the machine it's fine but if you give it kinetic assets like arms and legs or control over real world things that's where the trouble starts that's where the danger signals begin so as long as it's just a simulation with emotions or whatever it's just a simulation it's a collection of atoms within the computer once you give it access to the external world through uh, various sense organs or you give it kinetic access that's where it could actually start making a real world difference so that's the line maybe we should not cross is quantum computing combined with ai the closest we get to any of these apocalyptic sci-fi movies most likely yes this is where we should actually be a little afraid oh very much okay yes what is your final bottom line for this episode my bottom line is that we are at the at, at possibly an inflection point maybe we are going to see the unleashing of very uh, interesting very powerful technology that may change the world forever it may obviously place a huge amount of huge amount of power in the hands of a very few people maybe a, one or two governments which could not be a good thing for the world but if we use it like any technology if we use it for the betterment of humankind it could really change the world for the better it could eradicate all kinds of illnesses and diseases it could uh, you know cure cancer it could cure dementia alzheimer's parkinsons it could uh, make our lives healthier longer give us better technology maybe solve world hunger maybe help us uh, travel to different planets the possibilities are endless but like every technology it's a double edged sword it depends on how we use it as a scientist a geopolitical observer and a bit of an engineer do you think everything that you've said can happen in the next 50 years oh definitely okay uh Uh, i think nuclear fusion will happen in the next 10 to 20 years for sure we may we may have fusion reactors uh space travel traveling to the moon traveling to mars will definitely happen in the next 50 years maybe the next 20 years uh yeah and and uh, maybe high quality quantum computers with which can do cal- calculations with high fidelity without breaking down that may actually already be happening under wraps So I think everything we discussed could definitely happen within the next 50 years. I'm not sure about the alien part, but apart from that everything else. <laughs> okay. Good luck humanity. Just don't blow yourself up. <laughs> uh hopefully this is sent out into space uh 100 years later as a little memory of what humanity used to be. Used to be like <laughs> before before everything changed. Oh my god. If I ever have the money to I'll definitely send out a time capsule into space and put this episode in there in case my grand kids pass away because of a nuclear winter abhijit chawla sir thank you so much for this once again morbid episode <laughs> uh it was extremely enlightening i hope we did justice to the topic thank you very much thank you sir that was the episode for today another legendary episode with ac i'm going to link all our old ac episodes down below if this is the first time you're watching trs that's a little weird I don't understand how you've not seen any of the other AC videos that we've created on the show. We also have an epic Hindi podcast where we've done a bunch of epic conversations with this epic human being. Please go check those out as well. TRS will be back soon. We'll be deep diving into topics. I'm going to be as excited. I'm going to chase the happiness through curiosity because we on TRS baby special thanks to Abhijit Chawla. Special thanks to you guys. Lots of love. I'm out.